before the uh, 19th century, uh, people believed that uh, the molecules that make up uh, living organisms possess something special called vitality. And uh, this uh, concept was overturned once that uh, laboratory chemists were able to manufacture in the laboratory all the uh, known uh, organic compounds that were extracted from uh, living organisms. So there's really nothing special about vitality. There may be no, there is really no such thing. And today we consider uh, organic matter are just molecules which make up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and some simple molecules. Now on Earth, uh, most of the organic matter is in the form of kerogen, although uh, the, the biomass is actually a, small, a very small fraction of all the uh, organic matter. Now, the, uh, of course, the uh, kerogen is uh, a product of life, and uh, they uh, were deposited into the uh, sedimentary rocks after the decay of uh, living organisms. And uh, the question is that are there other forms of organic matter in the rest of the universe outside of the Earth? Now, uh, this, uh, uh, of course, uh, for uh, kerogen, we can analyze them in the lab. They are, I mean, they're related products of oil and coal and natural gas. So they have a structure of a very amorphous, uh, big aromatic and aphetic structure, and uh, that is, uh, uh, but they are all biological in origin. Now in the solar system, uh, uh, in the past, uh, 30, 40 years ago, we used to think that the solar system bodies are made up of uh, metals and uh, ice or minerals, but now, uh, after the ability to send probes to asteroids and comets and also bringing sample back to Earth for analysis and also by uh, an analyzing the contents of meteoroids in the laboratory, we now know that uh, either through uh, passive or active techniques that uh, solar system objects have a large amount of organics. I mean, First of all, the first is by remote uh, spectroscopic observations. The first step is just to detect uh, uh, molecular lines are similar to the, uh, the talk that we just heard, that uh, they uh, to identify various kind of gas phase molecules. But uh, once you pick up a meteorite, and actually, it, to everyone's surprise, they contained a large, very complex organics with a mixed aromatic and aphetic structure. And uh, now it is possible, we now know that uh, almost every family of uh, uh, organic molecule have been identified uh, in meteoroids. That, uh, that includes everything that is relevant to uh, uh, living organisms have been found. But of course, the, in the meteoroids, we believe this uh, organic matter were created abiologically. So as evidenced by the decreasing abundance with increasing carbon number. Now another component of the meteoroids other than the soluble component is the in, <coughs> insoluble component which make up 70% of the mass. And uh, this again, uh, the structures can be determined. They are found to have uh, uh, structures of a small number of aromatic rings connected by aliphatic chains of different orientations and names and, and so on. And in terms of abundance, uh, elemental abundance, they are make up of primary carbon and hydrogen, but there are also traces of uh, sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen, and other impurities. <coughs> so, um, now, the, of course, uh, the, uh, now we know that uh, many other solar system objects like the, in the planetary dust particles, which we can bring back and uh, analyze uh, on Earth. We can take uh, samples back from comet, both the in situ remote observations as well as sample return. And we'll hear more talks uh, 
uh, in, uh, for example, coming out from the World Seller Mission in this meeting, and uh, uh, asteroids. Now, the evidence is le less uh, strong, but uh, uh, we can look at the optical properties of uh, asteroids, and they are believed to also, in the surface, they have complex organics. Now, uh, Titan, I mean, uh, we, we know that both in the atmosphere of Titan uh, and on the surface, in sand dunes and uh, in the lakes, they have uh, uh, a seas of hydrocarbons, and uh, in the space on community, these are commonly referred to as solids, which is, a, uh, again, a amorphous uh, hydrogen carbon compound where mixed with the, the element nitrogen. Now, the, uh, the old picture has been that uh, everything in the solar system were made fresh after the formation of the solar system. So uh, we start with uh, some uh, gas. They were totally cooked within the solar system. But the questions that we have, uh, we want to discuss today, is there any possibility that uh, some of the uh, uh, primordial materials in the uh, solar, solar system were brought in from the outside and they survived through the formation process. So I want to talk about the late stages of cellular evolution uh, in particular because this is where the element carbon is made by nucleosynthesis. So carbon is made from a core, they are brought in up to the surface through convection, they are ejected from the surface by the process of stellar winds, and in the stellar wind, we know from direct observations they can form over 70 some gas phase molecule through, for example, the rotational uh, transistors that uh, you just heard Pepper talk about. And uh, these things are interesting because we have a firm time scale. The stellar winds have a dynamical time scale of only about 10,000 years. That means every of these 70 some molecules that we see in the stellar wind have to be manufactured by some chemical processes within that time scale. Now, not only they make molecules, they also make solids, uh, minerals. I mean, so from infrared spectroscopy, we know that uh, many thousands of uh, uh, EWAP stars show the uh, Amorphous silicate uh, 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 feature, and uh, several hundred of them show the uh, silicon carbide uh, uh, feature. Now, so these, the, uh, the phase after the uh, uh, so called asymptotic giant brain, which is really a evolved red giant phase, is the planetary nebula phase. Now, approximately 95% of all the stars probably include our sun, will become a planetary nebula. They are very bright and uh, they are very easy to, to observe. Now, if the, uh, the uh, planetary, the, the, the progenitor stars make solid particles and molecules, would they survive during the planetary nebula phase? Now, but when uh, astronomers look at a spectra of planetary nebulae, they, they had a great surprise because we did they, uh, they were not dominated by silicate or silicon carbide, but by a uh, set of very strong uh, so-called identified infrared emission features as 3.3, 6.2, 7.7, 8.6, .7, and 11.3 microns. Now, it was very really interesting. Right after the discovery, there were two papers in Nature by Julian Willems and Roger Neck proposing that 3.3 micron feature is due to aromatic CX stretching mode. But at that time, no one believed them because everyone thought, no one thought it was possible to create uh, organic matter uh, in a uh, very low density environment. Now, these uh, features are seen all the way in external galaxies. They are seen up to out to redshift of two. That means 10 billion years ago, we already have uh, these kind of compounds are present. Now, the, 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 the thing is that since the planetary nebula phase had a very short lifetime, only about uh, 20,000 years or so, and uh, they were not present in the previous evolutionary phase, that means the carrier of these features have to be made within a period of thousands of years, which is extremely short. And uh, so, now because there is a gap between the uh, evolved red giants and the planetary nebula where we 
before we didn't see any of these features and after we do, so that it would be very useful to find some the missing objects between these two phases. And with a long story short, that's what we did in the uh, 19, uh, we had discovered about uh, 30 of these so-called proprietary nebulae, which were transition objects. They have a lifetime of about two to 3,000 years. They are in transition between the Ewolf red giants and the planetary nebula phases. So now after these objects were discovered, we proceeded to do our spectroscopic studies, and we found several new things. One is that they show, the, uh, uh, in addition to the 3.3 .3 micron uh, CH aromatic stretch, uh, vibration mode, they also have the 3.4 micron feature, which is due to CH stretching modes of uh, methyl and methylene groups, uh, which are a, a, an emphatic group. And the second, as uh, so you illustrated uh, in this schematic diagram. And uh, the second thing we found is that in addition to the very strong 11.3 micron CH hour plane bending mode, by the way, CH hour plane bending mode, meaning that the, the H patterns are bending in this way, relative to the plane of the uh, aromatic ring. And uh, they also have other features, which is from laboratory studies were known to be due to uh, uh, CH bending modes, which our plane bending modes, which are uh, of aromatic uh, uh, rings with the more exposed uh, edges. The third thing that, oh, by the way, this, so, so these are the, uh, the detected uh, lines. And the third thing that we found is that in addition to these uh, features, which are a couple microns wide, they're also I mean, I'm sorry, which is uh, a fraction of a micron's right. We also have broad emission plateau features, which are about two microns wide. And they occur at around the, the wave wavelength of eight micron and, uh, and 12 micron. And uh, we interpret those to be due to uh, a superposition of a, uh, a variety of adiphatic side groups which are illustrated here because from uh, laboratory studies, uh, uh, chemists knew that uh, uh, the in-plane bending modes of a lot of these aliphatic side groups occur around 8 micron, and a lot of these aliphatic side groups have our plane bending mode around 12 micron. So if you have a lot of junk, which are somehow attached to the aromatic rings, and to collectively, the superposition of the in-plane bending mode and out-plane bending mode would give rise to a broad uh, emission plateau that we are seeing. So these are just some schematics on the possible uh, uh, structure of these uh, aliphatic side groups. So now how did these things come about? We have some constraints. We know that uh, these uh, aromatic and aliphatic compounds, they were first seen in protoplanetary nebulae. They were not seen in the, the evolved stars. And in evolved star, we have uh, uh, hydrocarbons, we have cyanobolians. So we have all the ingredients, uh, but we, if you, we look at uh, the most evolved uh, uh, carbon stars, which is those ones uh, I didn't have time to go into details. Those are totally obscured by their own ejector. Uh, we see the signature of acetylene. So acetylene uh, has a line at 11.3 micron, which is uh, uh, here. And that would, that this line is only, acetylene is only detected in the most evolved uh, carbon stars. So acetylene being a linear molecule, could be the first step of formation of benzene. So indeed, if we look at protoplanetary nebulae, we see uh, 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 the first detection of benzene, and, uh, and also with uh, diacetylene and triacetylene, and uh, leading to the uh, first uh, formation of the first ring. So these all occurring within a lifetime of approximately uh, 10,000 years. Now, in the subsequent evolution in the protoplanetary nebula phase, which are only a couple thousand years, that we probably have a clustering of these benzene rings into units 
of uh, rheumatic rings. And these rings collect all kind of junk from the uh, gas phase. Uh, they form the aliphatic chains that are of different kinds of composition that attach to the rings. And uh, when the star evolves further into the planetary nebula stage, which is characterized by a very hot central star and the onset of uh, uh, ultraviolet photons, then photochemistry would uh, maybe uh, uh, cause some of these rings to combine into larger rings and also cutting off with some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the outer contents of the uh, aliphatic structure. Now the whole UI and identify infrared emission feature is a very complex one. Not only they have these uh, dominant uh, aromatic features, they also have uh, aliphatic features, for example, by the uh, uh, CX stretch as 3.4 and bedding mode as 6.9 micron. In addition, there are a number of features uh, at longer wavelengths between 15 and 20 micron, which are totally not identified. And they have very broad emission plateaus, uh, in particular between 8 micron and 12 micron, which we think are due to a collection of in plane and out of plane bedding modes from aliphatic groups. So, so what's the chemical structure of the carrier? Now in the astronomical community, it has been extremely popular to attribute these uh, uh, aromatic features to the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecule, which is, uh, the, the, well, which is a very well known uh, uh, by chemists and they have, supposed to have about 50 carbon atoms and the, uh, these uh, planar molecules are excited by ultraviolet photons. So when the molecules uh, uh, relax and they emit the uh, uh, infrared photons uh, through vibrational transitions. Now, however, there are a number of problems with the pH hypothesis. Now, pH molecules, being molecules, they have very sharp lines, but the astronomical uh, spectra have very uh, broad features. Now, the pH molecules are primarily excited by UV photons, but we know that uh, these features are seen in nebulae with very low temperature central stars, in fact, lows of a few thousand degrees. They include re reflection nebulae, protoplanetary nebulae, and so on. Now, the UVH molecules, being very simple molecules, the electronic structures are well known. So there are a lot of uh, ultraviolet uh, electronic transitions which are known in the laboratory, and it would be very easy to detect them if these uh, molecules are indeed widespread in the diffused cellular medium. So a number of searches have been made, and very low upper limits have been placed uh, below about three order magnitude, below what is predicted from the emission strings of the infrared features. And uh, these molecules are small, and the rotational spectra are well known, uh, searches have been made for the rotational transitions, but to this date, not a single molecule, pH molecule, has been detected. And the chemists are, are, very, uh, uh, are very unhappy because they known pH molecules for decades. They have done all kinds of measurements in the lab, and to quote the Berkeley group, they say that no pH emission spectrum have been able to reproduce the UIE spectrum with respect to other band positions or relative intensities. Now, so what is the solution? So the proposed solution is that in the, in the cellular medium, we have pH molecules for a variety of geometry, variety of ionization state, variety of structures, and collection of these many diverse different kind of pH molecules together give rise to the UIE features. So now, if that were the case, then this is extremely flexible. And uh, I don't have time to show here. It is so flexible that the, uh, the same model that are used to fit the uh, astronomical UIE spectra can be used to fit anything else. So now, if it's not pH, what could it be? Actually, pH is only a very small part of a family of uh, hydrocarbons. Really? Because, yeah. And the, uh, the, uh, 
uh, we have um, uh, possible structures of amorphous structures that uh, by mixing hydrogen and carbon, you can create all kinds of amorphous structures. And in the laboratory, you can also try to do that. Uh, the, the principles are very simple. You mix uh, some gas phase hydrocarbons, you bombard them with energy, you create, uh, you collect the, uh, the uh, condensation of uh, uh, the, 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 the solid uh, condensates onto substrates, and you can analyze the spectra. And uh, the, uh, uh, the simplest kind of these kind of molecule, uh, compounds are uh, uh, hydrogenated amorphous carbon. So you can see that they have uh, isolated rings of uh, uh, aromatic rings, and then they're connected by aliphatic structures. And uh, they, uh, in nature, we also have similar kind of things through the result of combustion. Now you can compare the laboratory uh, infrared spectra of these kind of particles with the astronomical spectra, and you can see that there is a quite, a deal, quite a great big deal of similarities. So there is no feeling involved. These are all natural uh, direct comparisons. So now if you introduce some impurities in it, it could, for example, by uh, nitrogen, then you can have more complicated uh, structure. So. So to, to, in order to explain the UIE phenomena, that we have to explain the whole, the, the whole family of, of, uh, of structures, including the plateau and so on. So the model that we propose is called MYONG, which stands for Mixed Aromatic Aliphatic Organic Nanoparticles. And these are basically uh, uh, islands of aromatic rings connected by aliphatic chains of different orientations and lengths and with the mix of impurities in it. So now these kind of molecules, the vibrational spectra, are not well known. And uh, so at the present time, we're doing quantum chemistry calculations and you illustrate it here. So the, uh, the, the skeleton, the carbon skeleton, uh, could be deforming and they are, have uh, coupled with the uh, hydrogen uh, uh, stretching and bending mode. So it's, it's uh, very complicated. So it is very different from a pH molecule because it's three-dimensional, it has, uh, uh, it is amorphous, and the, uh, the, the, the rings have uh, 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 either one or two or three in numbers. Now, how do they form? Now, we don't know how do they form. Theoretically, it is impossible. But observationally, uh, we can see that they are condensing uh, in the circumstellar envelope on the time scales of hundreds, uh, hundreds of uh, years or thousands of years. In the case of Novi, they are even faster in terms of days or weeks. So you compare to this to the um, uh, uh, solar system objects, again, you can find a lot of simil structural similarities with uh, interplanetary dust particles, with uh, spectra in comet, in, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, atmospheric haze in, the, uh, in, in Titan, this uh, showing the uh, uh, 3.4 micron aliphatic uh, CH stretching mode. And uh, now, the discovery of pre-solar grains, which are uh, through the isotope ratio studies, are confirmed to be coming from a, a evolved uh, uh, red giant stars. They were uh, delivered onto the surface of the Earth as part of meteorites, which illustrate that the product of stellar uh, synthesis, chemical synthesis, can be transported across the Milky Way galaxy embedded in the primordial solar system and delivered to the Earth. And uh, whether these uh, uh, similar kind of things are happening, uh, you've got in the, uh, the organics is a possibility. So I want to summarize a little bit about, uh, let's see, first about the solar system that uh, we now see complex organic matter of a biological origin uh, in, uh, in, uh, in asteroids, in uh, uh, comets, in interplanetary satellites, in interplanetary dust particles. Uh, the question is whether these organics were made inside the solar system in situ or they were brought in from the outside. Now, from uh, stellar 
a chemical synthesis, we know that stars are able to make complex organic uh, in, on a very rapid time scale and on a very large, massive uh, uh, scale. They are uh, ejected into the interstellar medium, uh, large amounts, they are probably able to distribute throughout the uh, Milky Way galaxy. And the most important thing is that the time scale of uh, synthesis is a question of only uh, 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 a few hundred or thousands years. And these things are routinely made by ordinary stars. These are not special or unique events. They are basically uh, uh, going to be done by uh, stars which are like our sun. Now, whether there is a stellar solar system connection is very interesting. The detection of pre-solar grains suggests that these uh, products of Eopsak uh, and travel through the uh, interstellar medium. We have uh, macromolecular organics, and uh, whether these things have any connection with stellar organics is very interesting possibility. So to what extent the early solar system were enriched by stellar organics, and even more uh, interestingly, whether the early Earth was chemically enriched by uh, stellar organics. So I would just leave some references here, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sons, for a nice uh, summary talk. So.